This is Alex Bainbridge from Green Left, and I'm here with uh, Fred Fuentes to discuss the dramatic election victory for the MAS, the movement towards socialism, in the Bolivian elections which were held on October 18. Now, before we get into the interview, I just want to make a plug to everyone listening to become a supporter of Green Left if you're not already. It does make a big difference to our project if you're able to become a supporter, and it plans to begin at just $5 a month. Uh, you can also help simply just by you know, sharing this video and giving us a thumbs up. Now, turning towards these elections in Bolivia, they are notable because they resulted in a reversal of the military coup that took place at the end of last year, and an outcome which is difficult to imagine without a profound grassroots struggle by supporters of the MAS and the popular social movements more broadly. Now, Fred Fuentes is well qualified to comment on this. Uh, he's a journalist and author covering Latin American politics and writes regularly for Green Left. Um, we have already conducted one interview with Fred on the Green Left podcast, which I would encourage people to listen to, and the link is in the description below. Um, where we're not going to cover the same ground in this interview, but I'm wondering, Fred, if you could begin by briefly setting the scene about what the coup represents and the forces behind it. Uh, firstly, uh, thanks, Alex, for the for the opportunity. Uh, look, in terms of understanding the coup that took place in Bolivia last year, I have to understand it really as an attempt uh, by those who had been dislodged from power for the last 14 years in Bolivia to try to achieve what they had been unable to achieve through democratic means, and that is return to power once again. What we saw uh, in the months leading up to those elections, uh, on election day and in the days after the elections, was a con concerted attempt by those economic and political elites who, having been unable to defeat the movement towards socialism at the ballot box, had started to wage a campaign on the basis of trying to block the movement towards socialism being able to return to power in those elections. They'd already begun to question the legitimacy of the elections and whether Evo Morales should be allowed to stand as a candidate. Once the elections took place, they were very quickly out on the streets to decry fraud had taken place before any evidence had been uh, put forward to indicate that that had occurred. In fact, to ensure that no valid results could be obtained, they burnt down a number of the electoral uh, buildings uh, in some of the eastern eastern cities. Um, they then continued on the streets, even once Eva Morales uh, had been declared victor, but said that he was happy to go to a second round uh, in order to allow the people to express their will once again at the ballot box and see who would win, called on him to resign and aimed to basically create a situation on the streets that could be a pretext for a trigger of the kind of move we saw, which was essentially the military getting forcing Evo Morales to, to, to resign. Who were the main forces behind it? They were, by and large, the civic committees of Santa Cruz and some of the other eastern cities. Uh, civic committee is a nice sounding name, but it's essentially a conglomerate that brings together all the business interests in those cities. And Santa Cruz is really one of the economic sort of hubs of, of Bolivia, particularly for gas transnationals, uh, agribusiness as well in, in the state of Santa Cruz. So really talking about the, the, the biggest, most important economic powers in the country uh, under the guise of the Civic Committee leading these movements. Um, it was then also able to mobilise uh, sections of the traditional middle class who had always benefited uh, from their links to the traditional elites and to the traditional political parties. Uh, those more white sections of the middle class who had had access to jobs in the state or jobs at management level, access to universities, the kind of things that the vast majority of Bolivians had been excluded from, but were gradually being actually incorporated into over the 14 years of, of the mass government. And on the fringes were disgruntled sectors uh, who had previously supported the movement towards socialism. Uh, these are the kind of figures that the media tended to focus on to try to imply that this was really just a uh, supporters of the mass turning on, on, on the government. But by and large, what, what really what we saw was at the core of this movement was those who for 14 years uh, had been unable to defeat what, you know, the, the movement towards socialism on the streets, on the ballot box, using an opportunity uh, to, to seize, seize power and try to, from their position of power, try to move to crush the movement towards socialism. And that is what, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding in the sense of that is what we, tr what we saw the coup regime at least attempt to do. In, in, its, in its year in power, which is essentially to persecute, terrorise the movement towards socialism, force its leaders into exile at one point, even threatening to bar it from being able to run as a, as a political party. Uh, but ultimately, it was unable to, to do that because the mass was able to do what it's been so good at, combining street mobilisations uh, and, and parliamentary politics 
uh, in order to create create and open up democratic spaces for it to advance forward. Well, let's talk more about the MUS. Uh, a year ago, the MUS was deposed from power by, via this coup after they had won the elections, as you said. But a year later, it has you know it's been elected back into power with a bigger majority, which obviously a lot of people have been surprised by that. What is it about the MUS that can help to explain this turnaround? I think really to understand that is to under, understand what, what the MUS is. The, the MUS is not a, a traditional party or, or, or even new left party or, or of the kind that you know, many of us would probably know about. The, the MUS is really a conscious decision of some of Bolivia's most important Indigenous campesino organisations to say, look, it's not enough for us to have our local unions, our regional unions, our national confederation of unions, uh, and to keep fighting against bad laws. Ultimately, if we want to, if we want to progress, if we want to move forward, we need good laws. And the only way we're going to get good laws is by having good people in power, by having us in power to make laws for us. The, the other side will always make laws for them. We need to be the ones who make laws for us. Uh, and so that's why they very consciously choose to set up this party, but as a, as a really as a party movement, or as they call it, a, a political instrument. That is, it's seen as their electoral wing that works in tandem and is under the, the, the control of the social movements. The, the, the heart of the movement remains in the unions, but it understands the importance of uh, political campaigning, electoral campaigning, of using parliament. It's able to beginning in Cochabamba region, in the Chapare, where Eva Morales is a union leader with the coca growers, uh, get a get a, a bench in parliament. Uh, from there, it's able to expand, use that to reach out to other uh, Indigenous groups that weren't part of the original um, sort of uh, conglomeration of, of organisations that formed the MAS at its beginning, reaches out into urban areas to involve uh, neighbourhood committees uh, like, like those in El Alto to, to begin to incorporate them into the MAS. And so the MAS really is, is a kind of a, a very tightly woven network of local, regional and national unions, uh, community organisations, trade unions, uh, who all come together, particularly at election time, uh, to support the MAS and its electoral campaign. But in, in between elections are constantly mobilising for, for, for their particular rights and see really see the, the MAS as those that they elect to power to do the, to do the political work for, for them. Uh, so this can even create tensions between the, the social movement wing or the social movements and, and the parliamentary repre representatives who in some cases may not be immediately from the social movements. They might be um, uh, lawyers who have worked with the, with the social movements who have helped them in legal cases and so are seen to have a, the experience that can perhaps get them into parliament and know how to deal with laws, but are still viewed as kind of uh, invited. They're not really viewed as the core of, of the must. So when the coup happens then last year, and the coup regime turns not just on the mass as, as, as a party and, and, and not even just on the social organisations that make up the mass, but essentially on that, the, the, the social base that those unions represent uh, through its kind of anti-Indigenous discourse, even through symbolic things like taking down the Wipala flag and seeing the protesters uh, burning the, the Indigenous Wipala flag these kind of things provoke an immediate reaction, an immediate reaction that goes even beyond the election result. The, you know, the, the first protests were not about let's get Evo back. It was like we, we will not tolerate returning back to a society where you dare to do these kind of things to our, you know, our symbols as, as Indigenous people. And what that had meant was that you know, after 14 years, lots of disagreements, disgruntlement in, 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 the, in the social movements, um, differences over everything from... Uh, political strategy through to debates over who should have been candidates, all of these different networks of social movements and organisations saw what was under attack. And, and it wasn't just Evo, it wasn't just Evo's government, it, it was everything that those organisations stood for. And so that forced them to basically have to immediately come out on the streets against the coup and come up with a strategy, once again, working with its parliamentary wing, many of them who are direct members of the social movements, but not, all, not in all cases, and combining together to see how they could open up or keep open what democratic space there was. I mean, it's important to remember throughout this whole period, the, the MAS are very successful in maintaining parliament as, as an important body. Uh, the, of course, the coup government tried to over, uh, uh, override it, but the reality was the MAS still had the majority in the parliament and the coup, coup regime really found it difficult to completely bypass it or, or close it off. So together, these, these two wings... Um, 
work together, showed the country not just what the coup regime represented, but presented a, 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 an alternative to that, which was to build on the achievements of the 14 years of the Musk government, but also acknowledge the errors and say that moving forward, we would, we would revitalize, we would renew this process of change, we would bring all the good stuff with it and bring all the lessons we'd learned over the past year to make it e e even better and help get Bolivia out of the mess that it's in. I, I think it's very common in uh, mainstream sort of political discussion to sort of focus on the, you know, the figures at the top uh, rather than the social movements, as you say, and, and the, the, the balance of forces between different sections of society. But, I mean, I guess the question that comes to my mind after you've said those things, and some people have basically, basically been saying, I mean, well, this, you know, this election result proves that it wasn't really a coup and it was, uh, it was actually about Evo Morales' contesting that election last year. I mean, would, what would you say about that? I mean, does this mean that the, the controversy could have all been avoided if Evo had simply not run last year? No, that, that, that's, that's not at all the case that that would have happened. Firstly, because Evo won the elections last year and that didn't stop the controversy from happening. The reality was the, the, those results have not been shown to have been fraudulent. There's been all, all the speculation about the, the, the quick count, um, which is basically a, a very quick electronic tally. That means nothing in the final result. The final result is only the ballot papers that are counted in each ballot box which, as I pointed out, in some cases were burnt down by opposition protesters, ensuring that those ballots uh, uh, couldn't be counted. And, but the reality is that, firstly, it, it denies the fact that those that were against Evo or against the re-election of Evo weren't just against Evo. I mean, no matter who the candidate was, that very same thing would have happened. Um, that very same scenario, at least would have, that the attempt to play out that same scenario would have occurred. Um, what could have happened if Eva hadn't have been the candidate? Of course, it's very difficult to say, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very simplistic idea to say that it's all just a question of if a different face had have been there. But certainly, it's incorrect to imagine that just because a different face had have been there, those forces that have opposed the mass for 14 years would have all of a sudden decided it was no longer a threat to them because they understand, as I said, the threat is not Evo. It, it, it's not even the mass necessarily as a party. It's, a, it's that social base that it represents. It's that political movement of the poorest of the poor, the political movement rooted in the indigenous campesina sectors, but that reaches out into the urban poor sectors in the large cities. That is such a powerful movement that is by and large the biggest block in, in politics in, in, in Bolivia. So much so that even in these in the scenario of these last year, it could come back and win a, an absolute an absolute majority. So I, I don't think there's any evidence at all that it, it would have been a different scenario um, if Viva hadn't been a candidate. Of course, there are many other arguments that could be put forward that perhaps the mass would have gone weakened because it should also be remembered that the reality was that it was these same social movements that I'm talking about who decided that Evo was going to be their candidate. It, it was not like there was a, an internal uh, debate in the mass and other candidates came forward and social movements said we were going to support this one or that one or that in the lead up to the elections, large social movements said that they were not going to support Evo Morales. At all points, they felt that there was an importance of keeping Evo as, as a strategic leader. Um, of course, now they've had to force to be moved beyond that because in order to, because of Evo in exile, they've had to, you know, seek, seek out a new candidate. But that, of course, will bring, bring new, new, new challenges with it as well. Um, but what, is, what has been clear is that whilst everyone has agreed, including Evo, that Evo won't play any role in the new government in the sense of being a minister, uh, the the role that Evo will continue to play in the mass will be of, of absolute importance. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see that in, in, in the coming months and years, once, whenever it is that Evo decides to, uh, you know, he, he comes back to, to Bolivia. And I'm sure it will be, we, you know, we've greatly warmly received by the vast bulk of those social movements that make up the movement towards socialism. So what would you say are the lessons that can be, can be drawn from the Morales government and also the past year of struggle against the coup? I think there's I think there's a few lessons that already the the masses has sort of started to draw, uh, and and others that I think that they're starting to figure out what they mean for for moving forward. I think one was that there was a strong belief or strong reliance that good good governance and good good economic growth, good figures, you know, you know, as long as people were living better uh, than they were before, that that would be enough to sustain the the, the support. And what it showed was that that, that was not, not enough um, for a number of different reasons. Um, 
it was not enough for those who perhaps wanted to felt that there were other avenues for them to enrich themselves even more in, in, with, with a different government. Uh, there were, of course, those who perhaps once in a better position felt that the radicalness or the radical elements of the mass project were no longer necessary or perhaps were a potential hindrance, you know, perhaps were part of causing a political polarisation in the country. So there is an understanding there of the need to raise political consciousness as well uh, and, and think about how you, you can't, can't just rely on just uh, good, good economic growth and welfare distribution to maintain a support base. This is also uh, just as true as well for inside the, the, the state forces, the military and the police. There was a sense that you know, they, they, these institutions would remain loyal uh, to, to the government. And clearly what we saw in the coup last year uh, was that that was not, not the case. I mean, the police had throughout most of the mass government had a very conflictive relationship. So that was perhaps not so surprising. But certainly, I think for a lot of a lot in the mass, they were quite surprised when the high high command of the military uh, turned against them. So there's also, I think, that's another lesson that's been learned. That that's something that they're going to have to deal with. You know, how to do that, of course, is you know a, a, a debate that that will have to be had. Um, but I think that's a that's another important lesson that that they've learned. I think the other one, the other important lesson, and the one they're going to have to deal with is this this contradiction that um, you know is cannot be sort of uh, gotten rid of. It's just permanently going to be there. Um, but is how, how do you simultaneously be social movement, protest on the street, mobilisation and government? Um, because who are you protesting against? Who are you mobilising? You're mobilising against yourself in, in, in some respects. And what this meant was that after 14 years, we saw a certain bureaucratization of those social movements where the... the, the that previous understanding of the importance of the streets uh, sort of felt like it, it was no longer that important. The streets had already been won. Uh, people voted for us. We're not, you know, we're, we're not the opposition. Um, so really the focus became on the state, uh, access to the state, access to ministries, uh, you know, how we could use that uh, for good and bad, you know, uh, for, for good projects, but also in some cases for personal enrichment or if not personal enrichment, at least for... Uh, clientelist sort of kind of, uh, you know, uh, purposes of you know, a, a genuine sense of, look, er, you know, everyone else in Bolivia basically for the last 500 years has enriched themselves through the state. What, what's the problem if now, if, you know, a few small farmers get a, get a bit of extra loans or a bit of machinery um, a, out of this as well? So that's, that's a consultation. Now, the, the last year has, you know, once again made it clear how important keeping, keeping the streets is. Uh, yeah, keeping a high level of organisation and mobilisation. Importantly, this last year has thrown up a whole bunch of new leaders as well who have been you know, basically forged through, through the struggle and quite a number of them are now going to be in the, new, in the new National Assembly. They've been elected on the mass ticket. Um, some of them may also become ministers. Um, in other cases, there'll probably be ministers who aren't from these social movements who are for whatever educational, legal, technical reasons promoted to ministries, and we'll see that tension that I mentioned before between the social movements and the so-called invited. So all of these problems will, will re-emerge. But, but I think the difference now is that the mass understands that this is a, this is a problem, it, it's a contradiction, it's not going to go away, but it's an important one for us to manage because the last time they didn't manage it well, and what it meant was that the opposition seek using a very uh, strategic moment in time, we're able to capitalise on that demobilisation that had occurred and within weeks threatened the whole process of change. Now, in the end, you know, the, the movements hadn't been destroyed. They were still there. They were revitalised. They renewed and they've regained that power. But the opposition is not going to go away. Uh, so I think trying to, trying to grapple with that contradiction is, is going to be an important one and a, and, a, and, a, and a difficult one as well because it's not, like I said, there isn't, an answer to that. It's just a permanent tension that is just going to constantly exist and how to balance that out will be, will be absolutely key. What do you see is likely from the new government? What are the biggest challenges likely to be? I think there's challenges on two, two fronts. Um, the first very immediate challenge is uh, uh, the, the economic crisis and, and COVID-19. Uh, it's had a dramatic, both of those have dramatically impacted on, on Bolivian society and require immediate responses and immediate answers. Um, Bolivia's per capita death toll is among the top five, top five in the world. It gives you an indication of just how poorly mismanaged the pandemic has been. 
On top of that, it's estimated that Bolivia's GDP will contract by about 11% this year. The economy has been, the coup government has basically driven the economy to the ground, uh, sought out uh, foreign loans in order to indebt, indebt, the, indebt the countries to make it very difficult for any future government to be able to get out of those sort of loans. Um, in many cases, has basically brought to a standstill some of the industrialization projects that have been begun by the Musk government. So it almost has to, it hasn't completely destroyed 14 years of economic bonanza. And, and you know, the last couple of years of the Musk government had seen a, a, not those record high levels of growth. So that was already becoming an issue. But now, now they come back into a government in, in a very difficult situation. They don't have high commodity prices to, to be able to benefit off. Um, so this, this will be an immediate challenge. Now, the Musk government has indicated a few key measures that it's already working on. Um, what has is, what is it said is it, it's already going to do, amongst other things, uh, renegotiate the loans with the, with the foreign, foreign banks, the IMF, the World Bank, saying, look, you've got to either give us a moratorium or cancel, cancel this debt. We, we need to fight the pandemic. This is a, a global burden that we all have to share. And the way you can do that is by not forcing us uh, to pay these loans that in many cases were illegitimately signed with, with, a, with a coup regime. Um, it's also said it's starting to put a wealth tax. So it's not, not, a, not a tax on, on profit as such, but rather on those that have a lot of wealth right now to give some of that wealth to help with, 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 with dealing with, with the health pandemic. It's also said that it's going to reduce in, some, in certain cases the, the equivalent of the GST there as well as a way of both alleviating uh, the, the, the costs of daily life and also helping to, to stimulate internal, internal consumption. And also uh, 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 what they call a, a hunger uh, social security bonus. So basically a, a one-off payment uh, to, to families, to individuals to, to help with stimulating the economy and, and to help, to, to, to help um, make ends meet. So there's already a couple of things underway, but they're, they're just immediate things. They're, they're, they're not going to fundamentally transform the economy. And that's going to be the question of, you know, how, how do they move forward? On that, they, they count on a, on a very positive aspect, which is Luis Arce, the new president, was the economy minister for basically the large bulk of the 14 years that Morales was in government. So, and I think also in part explains why he was able to win back those sectors who remember what it was like under the mass government, saw what it was like under one year of the coup government in the sense of the economy and want to go back to, to some level of stability. So there, there, there's something there, but it's going to be a big challenge. It's, it's not going to be something that's going to be able to be, to be resolved immediately. I think then the second challenge or the, the second front of challenges, so you've got that is in terms of you know, how, how to basically govern the country, how to lift the country out of the, the, the problems is in. Those are the two immediate ones. Uh, after that, it can probably start to deal with some of the bigger questions of what's it finally going to do if it's a lithium deposits, for instance. Um, but that's, I don't think that's going to be its priority. I don't, I don't think that's the first thing it's gone on its agenda. Plus, the MAS already had some plans underway, and I imagine that they'll re restart those. Um, but, but for now, it's the economy and, and, and COVID. But the other one will be, you know, how, how to deal with this new situation um, where you have uh, a new president. Uh, very soon, a new cabinet will be announced. Uh, perhaps some old faces, perhaps not. Undoubtedly, some new faces, so new people now in the government. Uh, new people in the parliament, uh, new leaders in many of these social movements, uh, all of them, you know, wanting to kind of go in the same direction, uh, but all of, them, all of them as well with their own interests. And the reality is, is that previously, Eva Morales had played some kind of unifying role. Um, people would always say, oh, this, you know, he, he, just, he just controlled everything. But no, no, the difference was that he, he had a certain level of, authority and respect that could somehow bring all of these forces together on the table and no matter how heated those discussions were people walked away and, and kind of agreed with, with with the final decision and he won the, and the reality is and, and this is what's often forgotten you know people it's easy to now just turn see see as politics is all just one individual everything's just one individual um the, the reality was that when evo first became a trade union leader there were many other, including figures who are still around today, who had a much higher profile than him. Where he got his authority was just for proving in practice of giving some kind of direction as to the way forward. He was a key figure in the formation of the mass. He was a key figure at key turning points in politics where there were debates on the left on which way to go. And in some cases, 
Uh, he, he agreed with the rest of the left and went with them. In other cases, he carved his own path. And that was what ultimately led him to become the kind of figure he was, who then becomes a, a huge figure in Bolivian politics as president because he's the first Indigenous president. You know, all of a sudden, the, 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 the significance that brings of it really sort of elevates his figure. But he's not like, he's not someone who's, you know, he's not like a, uh, perhaps, a, let's say, someone like a Fidel Castro, who from day one, really, in the Cuban revolution was kind of the number one figure kind of thing and, and, and the leader of it. He, he's someone who won that space by proving in practice um, that on many occasions where everyone else was wrong, he, he was right um, and was able to maintain that set of semblance of unity. Um, now, obviously, uh, he's not going to have that same level of authority, nor is he going to be in that same position as he was before, where he was president of the country, president of the mass, president of the coca growers union. In fact, he said when he goes back to Bolivia, he's only going back to be the president of the coca growers union. You know, he, he'll leave the rest up to, 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 the other, to the other people. But this, this will be a challenge. This will be a challenge of figuring out, and this will be a big challenge for, for Luis Arce and for his vice president, uh, David Chokiwanka, who you know, does have some links with some of these social movements. So we'll, that will no doubt be, again, a, a both a, a, a positive and a negative, a positive that people will see with him reflected their kind of viewpoints, but undoubtedly there will be pressures there. And we've, and we've already seen it, you know, within days of last year's elections, we saw El, the city of El Alto saying that, well, as, as a, you know, we want as repayment for our loyalty uh, to electing Luis Arce five ministers. Um, you know, we saw the... The, the women's union, the Bartolina Sisa, uh, saying they want a ministry of the women created uh, with one of them as, as the minister. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying these are inherently good or bad, or I'm just saying these are the tensions, these are the real, real challenges that the government will have to face. Um, we'll see also very soon, um, because local elections have to be convoked very shortly after the presidential elections, that will be another big challenge as well for the mass. It, it's not the big picture stuff. The big picture stuff is still the economy and COVID, but they're going to have to deal with all these social movements that have now revitalized, reinvigorated, now feel once again part of the mass. Okay, well, how, how do you deal with when you've got in one community nine, ten different unions and each of them think that they should be the local candidate? How do you keep that movement unified and not see that all split apart again and once again create openings for, for the right? And that's, again, the, the tension of the mass as a, as a party movement. You know, that's, that's going to be, a, a, I think, a big factor. I think the positive, though, that they'll have is, is building on the momentum they have. You know, I think that's probably going to at least, you know, the kind of honeymoon period will at least allow Arce and Chokiwanka to move forward and perhaps have some good decisions in, in the cabinet and some early um, decisive sort of economic measures and measures on COVID-19 uh, will, will be really important in, in sort of extending that, that honeymoon period and giving them that, that ability to, to really deal with those big challenges that they have ahead. Yeah, thanks for that, Fred. Before we finish up, I wanted to ask you about the media coverage outside of Bolivia. Uh, I think uh, now that the coup has been defeated, there is actually a lot more widespread acknowledgement that, in fact, what happened was a coup. And obviously, some sections of the media have acknowledged that over the course of the past year, um, even though at the time they were... Uh, outright supporting the coup, if not, um, or else, uh, or else by you know by default, by you know in a de facto way, uh, were you know by not challenging it, were were sort of giving it support that way. I think this is true even on the left. Uh, Fairness and accuracy in reporting um, did an article about how some of the left media um, outside of Bolivia helped to support that coup narrative, and even in the last few days, there's been some media that is reluctant even to call the last year's developments a coup. So. I'm just wondering if you can make some comments about the media coverage over the past 12 months, including on the left, and uh, and, and and what you what you see that means for the for I guess for the solidarity movements around the world. Yeah, look, I, I so let's look at it in two parts. The first part is, I suppose, the the mainstream media, you know, coverage of it, and the mainstream media have for a long time not hidden their their opposition to to Evo Morales and and, and what he represents. You know, re, for them. Evo, Hugo Chavez is not very dissimilar to Bolsonaro, to Trump. You know, one might be left wing, one might be right wing, but essentially they're, they're sort of authoritarian populist sort of nebulous figures who, you know, the uneducated vote for. And, you know, if they only left politics for the, for the serious traditional politicians and every country in the world would, would be fine. Um, and so that's why you can, you know, you see all these op-eds you know, essentially trying to draw these, these parallels where, where none of them exist. Uh, 
ultimately, their, yeah, their, their project is defense of the, the established order. Um, and so that, that's, that's what their editorial lines are dictated by. And that's what most of their coverage is of, of events in Bolivia. So in, in that case, that they were absolutely, you know, over the, over the moon when, when they saw uh, Evo Morales, uh, uh, not only the fact that Evo Morales was, was overthrown, but they could present it as a victory for democracy, as a victory over someone who was trying to hold on to power and it was, you know, the people on the streets that, that somehow stopped him. It had nothing to do or totally secondary to that was the fact that the military, um, you know, the armed forces came out and basically told him to, to, to leave the presidency and, and get out of the country. Um, so that, that sort of is, is un, you know, unsurprising. Of course, now, unlike the coverage that last year's elections got, these elections a bit more muted. You know, it's easier to just ignore that. Uh, as you said, sort of brush over or sort of maybe make a bit, bit vague as to how, you know, how, the, how to explain these, these elections in comparison to last ones, uh, you know, basically saying, oh, you know, as, you, as you, one of your questions before, this, this just sort of proves that it was all just basically about Evo. You know, if, if Evo hadn't have been the candidate, nothing would have happened in the country um, because class forces don't exist. Uh, political differences don't exist. It's just all about individuals. And if one individual wants to hold on to power too much, that's, that's when society be, begins to crumble. A different view, though, is, is the one expressed by some of the, you know, the, those sections of the media that uh, attempt to, and in, many, and in many cases do play a positive role, in other cases not so much, uh, of trying to forge solidarity uh, with left organisations, left parties, left, left social movements. And, and many of them who had basically for a long time now decided that uh, the, the Bolivian politics was polarised between Evo Morales and the left, that somehow the, the right had disappeared or was, you know, secondary or t a tertiary factor in politics, that everything that we could understand of what was going on in Bolivia was really understood as social movements against the Evo Morales government, indigenous movements against the Evo Morales government, environmentalists against the Evo Morales government, workers against the Evo Morales government. Uh, this, this, is, this is what was happening. So, of course, everything then had to be projected through that same lens of what occurred during the coup. So we had the same thing. Oh, it's, this is indigenous people out in the streets against Evo Morales, ignoring the fact that 47% of Bolivia's population, by and large, mostly the indigenous Campesino populations had just voted for Evo Morales as, as the president. Those voices, of course, get silenced because in, 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 under the pretext or the discourse of uplifting voices, the only voices that we hear are those that happen to coincide with those of the, that these people in the media uh, 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 reflect their views. We saw that as well, uh, not, not just uh, in the representation of Evo Morales, we saw that in the representation of, of the protest, and even to a certain extent until it just became too difficult of the coup regime, a justification of how actually it was a constitutional government, how actually, yes, it was, you know, unfortunate some of the things that the, the coup regime was doing, but we should just be pressuring the coup regime. You know, if we, you know, if we maintain the pressure that was against Morales now with the coup regime, totally missing the fact that th th what the coup regime was doing was by and large reflecting what the base of those mobilizations against Eva Morales had wanted. That is why the coup regime did that. That was its, that was its base that it was trying to consolidate. After its mismanagement of the, the pandemic and the economic crisis, you know, it struggled to even maintain that base. And that's why we see the, the coup president, Janine Añez, firstly trying to position herself as the unity figure of the opposition, in the end having to withdraw from the presidential race because her, her figure had declined so far, uh, so, so much. Um, so all, all, of, all of this is to say that, you know, a lot of this justification of it wasn't a coup, um, was all trying to fit into their vision of what was occurring in Bolivia. But just like the right-wing opposition, these same people can't understand what the mass really represents. What the mass really represents is what I started with, this tight-knit network of social organisations, movements, uh, collectives, uh, uh, um, committees in, in urban, urban areas, who all of them with their, you know, variety and, dis, you know, differences of opinions, of demands, or, you know, contradictions amongst themselves, fighting amongst themselves, see within the mass their political instrument, see within Eva Morales their presidency, their government. Um, will they criticise those governments? Uh, absolutely. Um, will they criticise ministers in those governments? Even more so. Uh, 
but fundamentally, they still see that as their political instrument. It's what they've built up since the mid '90s. It's what's got them what to where they are today. Um, and breaking that down, well, firstly, is you know really what the right wants is wants to achieve. But it's not saying that's going to be done easily. And the, the right wing haven't been able to do that, even even having been given a year of a head start in these elections campaigns. They had a year to send most of the mass leaders into exile or imprison them. Uh, they had a year to basically ban candidates from being able to run, including Evo Morales, who wasn't able to run as, not just as president, although he wasn't going to run as president, but wasn't able to even able to run as, as senator. Um, they had a year to carry out a number of massacres in the days after the coup. Uh, they had a year to run a, a, a demonization campaign in the media, uh, referring to the mass as everything from narco-terrorists to to violent hordes, um, to you know, what, whatever you want to, whatever you wanted to call them, that that's what they were being called in the media, and the and 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 this political movement came back bigger and stronger, um, and so the inability to understand that, to wish to see it some way different, to wish that somehow the process was somewhere different, to wish that it wasn't a case that Evo had the authority that he did have. Um, to wish that, you know, perhaps it was someone else who was the president. I think that's what many of them wish that also had happened. And they're not even that, you know, it's kind of funny. They both simultaneously uh, don't like Luis Sarce, but at least he's not Evo Morales, so they begrudgingly have to like him. But it all goes back to then seeing politics as individuals. And it misses this bigger picture that for the, for, for the Bolivian people, Evo can only be understood as the kind of embodiment of something that's much more than that. But with a recognition that that doesn't mean that Evo can't be wrong, that, that Evo doesn't need to be replaced at some point because that political movement has to live beyond that. But for today, that political movement has survived a very heavy year, a very difficult year, a year that can only be explained because of the coup that occurred last year, not because of any democratic spring as, as the media and some of these other sort of solidarity, supposed solidarity groups tried to explain it to us. Um, they come back stronger and they're going to continue to, to come back stronger and, and prove once again, like the importance of what it means to really build a political movement of the oppressed in a country, to build something so strong that no matter how many of the other powers are aligned against it, they're still unable to crush it and to defeat it. Uh, that doesn't mean that their victory is forever proven. There's still many big challenges, but it's, it's, a, it's a sign that says that it, you know, not, Nothing is nothing is, is all powerful that can that um, that that can stop a, a movement that's strong enough um, being able to achieve its aims as the movement towards socialism has been able to do in Bolivia today. Okay, well, thanks very much for those comments, Fred. It's all, it's very important for us here in Australia to follow developments like this in Bolivia, uh, both from the point of view of us to be able to express our solidarity, but also to inform and for us to learn ourselves about the our own efforts at social social change in this country. So, yeah, I'd like to thank you for those comments. And for everybody watching, I'd like to thank you. Yeah, th th firstly, thank you for watching. Uh, for those of you that are Green F supporters, I'd like to thank you very much for that because it is critical to our ongoing support. And if you're not a supporter, um, please consider doing so today. And uh, you can also support us on Patreon. And without even paying a cent, you can share this video and uh, you know give it a thumbs up. That's all ways that you can sort of uh, that you can show your support. Thanks a lot.